I went to go after the dude and Rod Smith grabbed me and was like, what are you doing, man? You're getting, you might get knifed up there in the crowd. Welcome to another episode of Sugar Snake Takes. We're with my man, Snake Plumber, Sugar Rashad Evans, Mike Slavin. How are you guys doing today, Jake? You're you're back in uh, you're back in Coeur d'Alene, or is that where it is? Is it Coeur d'Alene? Yeah, back up in North Idaho on the lake, chilling out, enjoying family time, and uh, getting some work done too. You know, there's always work to be done and things to do, but. Mixing that in with some lake dips and some yoga and some meditation mm. on the dock and like just relishing in the abundance, man. Enjoying life. Right on. Yeah, the the work is never done. Like our boy Sat saying right here, this is one of his paintings he gifted me. The work is never done. And that's the God honest truth. That's the truth. So, <laughs> are you doing Rashad? What are you up to? Where are you at? You in Florida? I'm good. I'm in uh no, I'm actually in Buffalo. <laughs> Buffalo, Niagara Falls area. Came out here to do a little bit of work with Naturals to go and uh, see the family, man. It's a lot of birthdays around this time, a lot of cancers. So, uh, you know, we've been having some birthday celebrations, graduation celebrations. So, uh, good family, good family time. Nice. Air quality a yeah. lot better than last time you were there, huh? Yeah, a lot better. <laughs> no, no, no fire. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that was that was episode one, which actually kind of launched it won't be the right time when we when this one airs but just launched yeah. the other day so super excited about that thanks to you mike how you doing mike doing good i'm excited we got an interesting uh subject matter for today so i'll be i'll be very curious to hear what snake and sugar have to say yeah absolutely so so what brought this one up the the idea is athleticism as a universal language and I was recently in Todos Santos, Mexico, and I went into a dope jiu-jitsu gym there, Todos Santos, BJJ. Uh, you know, and this, this, this gym is, it's what I like to see in a gym. There's a little bit grimy, you know, there mm -hmm. was puddles on the mat because it rained the night before and the, and the roof kind of had some deals there. But, you know, the, the ability of sport and athleticism for people to come together of all walks of life, because in Toto Santo is kind of a expat kind of town, you know, there's a lot of people from all around the world. So you're hearing multiple languages on the mats. I had this deep realization, like, man, it's really beautiful. I could travel anywhere in the world and I could walk into a jujitsu gym and I can roll and I could mm -hmm. earn respect and I could, I could communicate without, using language and uh even even just rolling with these guys for a couple of days i started seeing them out in town you know one of them was renting me surfboards in other words telling me where to you know go park for free at the beach and all these kind of things you know and it was just it's kind of a very beautiful thing athleticism as a universal language whether it's you know basketball soccer is probably one of the bigger ones jiu-jitsu obviously and so it made me think you know what you guys have probably traveled the world and uh, through your careers. And it made me think, you know, hey, what, I wonder what these guys think about, you know, utilizing sport and athleticism as a language of uh, relatability. So I don't know who wants to jump in and, and start and, and give us a story and uh, some advice about um, this type of topic. Yeah, I'll go ahead and uh, see, I just got back from a big trip uh, a little while ago to Europe. Um, I didn't do a whole lot of sports when I was there, but, um, there was a lot of language going on on the bikes on the road as you're driving through Berlin and like communicating without really communicating, but knowing like the flow of bikes and like getting over. So someone faster could pass you and felt really cool to be in Europe where there were more bikes at some, some moments, more bikes on the road than there were cars. Uh, back up here to North Idaho, I'm like getting blasted by these big dually diesel trucks. They're like Bleh! black smoke everywhere. And it's like, Oh, Europe. I love Europe. We ride our bikes over here. It was really fun. So that was cool. Um, you know, I guess when we say athleticism, I think more of movement or even just, uh, activity, 
really just being being mobile and active and not you know going somewhere and just sitting around in a pub or going and you know you know walking the streets but like going to the park um you know we saw uh, a lot going on in berlin at tempelhof where people were skateboarding and rollerblading and i wish i'd have my skateboard because it was like damn i'd have got out there and started skating as a as a way of like people accepting all levels it was really cool to see that communicated um but when i think of the you know a couple things that that uh one that i want to do that i haven't is go to ireland where the game of fives you know five fingers handball that's where the game was supposedly invented and rumor has it when you drop off of the plane in, in ireland if you have some handball gloves attached to your carry-on or your backpack that you'll have a game before you leave the airport set up <laughs> so i haven't i haven't gone to, i've flown through just ireland on the way to europe or to um germany and berlin but i haven't stopped in ireland so that's on my bucket list uh but i did make a trip uh, not too long ago to mexico city with the broncos and they were teaching football to uh you know to the to the hispanics or the mexican population down there mexico city and in monterrey to try to introduce the game to the kids and so not being able to speak fluent spanish being able to speak a little bit but being able to like to to you know draw on my hand like go down and to the middle of the field you know and throw the ball and then celebrate you know it was a, a very common language and then to see the kids smile when i'd say all oh, right or yeah you know like that's just a language that was that was fun to to see as as football i can't really go out and have a pickup game of football unless I'm like Patrick Swayze and uh, point and point break, you know, like <laughs> out on the beach, which can happen. But the, that was fun to be in Mexico City to use football as a, a form of communication, uh, to be able to go out with these little kids and, and throw the football to them and smile and laugh. Uh, really was really special. Um, I was grateful for the Broncos to to fly me and Terrell Davis down to be ambassadors for for the Denver Broncos down there. Uh, it was a lot of fun. We had a great time and, and that's how we communicated. You know, pe people were really excited to see me 16 years removed from playing in the NFL just because of what I did, what I, the athleticism I had, what I what I did on the field. And even some of these kids didn't even know who I was. It was just who they were being told that I was that made it you know, impressive to them. And so, yeah, I think movement is really the universal language, whether that's dance whether that's yoga, I know and took a yoga class in Berlin, which was really cool to be in a class with people from from uh, Europe, from Germany, taking yoga. So there's there's really a lot out there culturally that you know you can go to certain certain countries and there's certain games that they play. But um, you know I make sure usually to be carrying around a frisbee or a or a hacky sack. And uh, even in Germany, we bought ping pong paddles because that game's huge. There's ping pong tables in the parks, which was so fun to just be strolling through Germany and stop and play a quick game of ping pong. So, yeah, movement and athleticism opens up a lot of doors, uh, mainly for your own selves. It's good for you. But then, like you said, Dale, you, you make connections that way really easily. You make a really strong connection just through whether it's competition or a love of, the, of, of something like handball. Yeah, very cool. I, I – uh... I like the idea of celebrating, right? Because you have a common goal, no matter what the language is. And if you're running patterns on your hand, you know the goal. When it happens, you're a team, you know. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, super rad, Rashad. How about you, man? What's uh, give us some give us some story on that action? Yeah, you know, like, like Jake was saying, you know, um, movement is that universal language. Movement is our first language, and you know, I just think about the times where I've, you know, been traveling for doing MMA, and uh, when I was in Thailand. You know, just being able to, you know, everybody, they, they, they knew me from doing my MMA and things like that. But it was it was cool to be received the way that they received me. You know, they wanted to learn. And it was just such a way of a, a welcoming way, you know, such a welcoming way. And there is this camaraderie. There is this brotherhood that happens like when you're when you're part of that family, you know, and it cuts through race. It cuts through so many of the things that in regular society kind of holds us back. You know, and it's, and it's very interesting to see how just that commonality in sport just cuts through all the things that we struggle with in society. You know, we pass law to try to get rid of some of these, you know, injustices and things like that. But in sport, they just go. 
you know, and, and it just kind of goes to the deeper thought of, well, you know, it, it's, it's a commonality, right? It's, it's the belief in the same thing. It's the enjoyment of the same thing that we, we get when we're next to each other or when we're having that thing that we're doing, playing a game with each other, it's that bonding time. And it's the respect that you have for doing it, right? Because it's challenging and whatnot, and you get that respect. And it's like, if we could have that, that mindset, that, that, that strengthening of, of what binds us together and just the rest of our existence, I'll tell you what, man, our society would change overnight, you know? And it's one of those things that, that makes you think about that once you think about sport. You know, I, I've heard uh, Sean Strickland uh, one of the baddest 185 pounders right now in the UFC and uh, a very controversial figure just because he just kind of says what he says. You know what I'm saying? Like it just comes out when he says it. But there was there was talks about him before being a skinhead. You know, he used to be a skinhead, he used to be a racist. And now one of his best friends is, you know, is a, is a black dude. You know what I'm saying? It is uh, is um, uh, Chris Curtis, you know, and it just kind of goes to show like what, what this sport can do, what sport can do, you know, just bring people together and just kind of erode those beliefs that they may have had growing up and, and whatever about whatever thing, it just kind of erodes it and really gets to just kind of peel the eye back, peel the layer back and really get to see the person on a human level. And, and, that, and that's where we struggle with a lot of times, right? Just seeing each other on a human level, just seeing each other at that eye to eye level without, you know, trying to be the dominant one in the situation or trying to portray yourself in a situation because at the end of the day, the sport's the ultimate leveling ground, right? The sport's the ultimate, you know, the, the, the ranking of the system and how it goes, you know what I'm saying? And if you compete it long enough, you know that you don't, if you're on top, you don't shit on a guy on the bottom because at the end of the day, <laughs> there, there was a time where you were the guy on the bottom. So you remember that, you know? So those are the things that, that, that make the sport in general just something that if we can model in society, this the world would be a better place to be. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. That's something I absolutely love about the UFC in particular. It's, it's very much, you know, we've got this video game intro that we, we do at Sugar Snake Takes, and it's, it's, it's a lot of what the UFC is. You know, you've got Irish guys and Russian guys and then, uh, you know, just everybody from all these different countries who are speaking the same language, coming together, representing their country, Brazil, you know, New Zealand, yeah. Australia, all these, it's a worldwide sport. And you kind of have these characters that lean into their culture. And it just kind of creates a little bit of curiosity about that, like the, the bravado or, you know, whatever it might be. Yeah. It's a, it's a really cool thing. Is there any particular country that you've been to where there's a, there's a different way of doing things or like when you're in the room where they, they go hard. Cause I, I will say in, in Mexico, I threw this dude in a, in a darse and uh, he was not going to tap. He was not going to tap. And I've only passed out people three times, twice my coach and one other guy at another gym in mm -hmm. Arizona. And I thought, Oh shit, you don't want to be the visitor knocking people out in your gym. You know, in, in their yeah, gym, yeah. Know that culture is going to be like, you know, so it kind of like, oh, shit, I hope you're OK. But this dude in Mexico, he wasn't going to tap it. So I had to let it go or whatever. But is there any sort of like lessons that you learn from other countries about the way they are via grappling? Training wise? Yeah, yeah, yeah there, there, there are there are certain things like um, like when I was training in Thailand, you know, it was it was like, you know, they like any kind of feet to the face or anything like that is just completely <laughs> off limits. So like, you, you know, like to kick somebody in the face or something like that, you know, with the <laughs> foot to the face or something, you know, it was, you know, they, they, they don't like that too much. But, um, uh, I've been, I've been to some few, few places where it, it was just like, first of all, whenever you go into a new gym anyways, it's always that balance, right. Where you don't know how hard you should go and you just kind of feel it out because, you know that you're the new kid on the block. And no matter if you go with somebody who is, is not the best in a the room, they're going to go at you like it's a tournament, you know, so you got to be ready to go. So you always got to kind of let people know where you stand at. But I remember when I was in uh, Dubai training with uh, Sheikh Tahnoon. Uh, Sheikh Tahnoon is a uh, Gracie black belt, long time. And he's an older guy, but he likes to have like fighters come down so he can train, right? And me, I'm like, 
I'm like, okay, you want to train? So I go in there, I go, I go super hard. And I'm just like, you know, that's not, that's not what he wanted. You know what I'm saying? Like he wanted a nice like role where you just kind of like, you know, it's, it's, it's more like a gentleman's role. You know what I'm saying? It's like a gentleman's role. Like we, we out here, we're moving, we ain't trying to kill each other type thing. But for me, I'm, I'm used to just surviving. Right. So like, if if we're if we're going, then I'm like, all right, you're trying to rip my neck off or pass me out, so <laughs> let's go. So it, it was just it, it was just a different kind of switch because training at the gym that I was training with with the likes of Vitor Bell for Alistair Overeem, Tyrone Spong, and all the killers, Anthony Johnson, and I would train with. Like you went into the gym, you had to be ready to fight. You know what I'm saying? Like you you go into the gym some of those days, and some of those days you walk out and you feel like man, I don't think fighting is for me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So you got to be ready. But it, it, it's just a matter of knowing when to turn that off. No doubt. Some some struck me when you were talking a couple times, Rashad, was like you said commonality and then it binds us. And it's really movement, athleticism, sport. It's a common bond that you have immediately with somebody from anywhere, any place, any time. And uh, that's really the beauty of of act being active you know being able to go and have the uh the wherewithal and the body control and actually like to actually in your daily lives have something you do i found myself looking at all these people in in berlin and temple off like what is it that i do daily that brings me joy what is it that brings me this joy that i want to do even if i was in the middle of egypt you know wherever it is that you want to do that and then that's where that common bond is able to be uh, explored so just a little mm-hmm. extra sugar on sugar and snake on and the top. A little of that, extra but. sugar, I did a little sprinkle. <laughs> awesome, sweet guys. So we're talking about athleticism as a universal language, but there's other types of universal languages out there, and uh, one of those is spoken through the eyes. You know, you can you can kind of see what someone is feeling or thinking even. With, with enough eye contact. So there's a test called reading the eyes test where you can kind of you know, gauge your ability of reading someone's emotions. So I dug up some of these, some of these questions to see if, you know, how keyed in you guys are on uh, these emotions that people are feeling. So Jake, we'll kick it off with you. So how this is gonna work, I'm gonna show you an image of someone's eyes and there's gonna be four associated emotions with that image. You need to choose the emotion that is represented by their eyes. Okay. All right. All right. So we got this, like this guy's eyes. Is he serious, ashamed, bewildered, or alarmed? That dude right there is as serious as Sam. I am not serious. He is serious. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You can see he's focused. He's in it. It's like yeah, the game I, I play play with uh, my, my son, my two year old son. Are they happy? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah, that dude right. scary. He does look scary. Yeah. He look like Uncle right. Fester. <laughs> <laughs> he does. He zoomed out. He probably have a bald head. Um, <laughs> all right, so we're gonna do Rashad. You're gonna be next since you play this all with right. your son. I expect I expect a you know high oh, performance no, here. Oh, the pressure. Okay. All right, so. Is this woman, is she joking, cautious, arrogant, or reassuring? Hmm. That's a cautious look. Like, I'm, I'm watching what's going on here. Like, that's a woman, you know, I caught something. That's cautious for sure. So S- Snake was pretty tapped in. Is, is Sugar connecting with the eyes? He is. Cautious is correct. Nice. Nice. That's a tough one because that's a little bit of arrogance in that too. Or... <laughs> that's dope. All right. Let's see. All right, Dell. Good one. Are we going to have the clean sweep here? Let's see. Is he joking, insisting, amused, or relaxed? He's amused. I'm going to go with he's amused. Amused and joking, isn't that kind of the same thing? Mm-mm. No? I think okay. they, can be, they can be subtly different. Amused. He's not amused. Ooh. Yeah. Yep. So you thought it was, Jake? 
Yeah, that's what I was going to go with immediately. It looks like he just is like come on. trying to get someone to do something. Like, come on, we're, we're going here. Eat the banana so we can go on the hike. Okay. Okay. <laughs> we got one more bonus round. I want to see, you know, let's let's a, a little extra test here for all, all right. of you guys. What are we thinking? I want you all to guess. Okay. Is it oh, arrogant? Guess. Okay. Grateful, sarcastic, or tentative? What do we think? Mm -hmm. I know my answer. Uh, I know mine too. All right. Oh, man, I'm, I'm not as emotionally intelligent as I thought I was. <laughs> uh, you are, it's just the eyes. Yeah, it's tough, the dude. eyes never lie. The eyes, eyes never, never lie. lie. Yeah, I've got mine. Jake, you say yours first since you had it first. I was going with grateful. You're going grateful. What about you, Rashad? I said I got tentative. And Dell? I was going to say grateful as well. It's tentative. Oh! Socrates is tapped in. Dang. Wow, okay. That's slick, Rashad. <laughs> hey. slick. Yeah. There's, there's a test where they have, like, I don't know how many it is, like, 18, 25 of these different images. So you can kind of on a, on a longer sort of um, sample size, see how well you can, you can gauge this. So what's the test called? Is there a name for this test? It's called reading the eyes test. I can uh, send you a link. We can add a link to the show notes as well for any listeners who want to. Yeah, uh, that's cool. Yeah. Hey, but, I, um, I'm, I'm, I got, I'm, I'm probably pretty good at this game. Cause I mean, I always got a guess what's wrong with my wife. Like, what's wrong? <laughs> 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 the guess was wrong with me, game. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. You've been cool. well, well practiced, huh, Rashad? Yeah, well practiced. Well practiced. I get that no, practice all the time, but I'm failing <laughs> every guy the last day. Awesome. That's well, cool. let's move into the community Q&A. Again, uh, you know, for those who may be first time listeners, this is a part of the, the show where we really ask our community, you know, what are the questions that you have for Rashad and Jake? And if we pick your question, we're going to send you free product. So always be on the lookout for prompts where we're going to ask you for these questions. And today's question, we are, it's from uh, Tiernan McKiernan. That's uh, quite the name. Um, questions for Rashad, but we're going to ask you as well, Jake. If you could have done anything differently in your MMA career, what would it be? And uh, so, Jake, for you, that will be, you know, obviously your football career. And I'd also like to hear, um, in line with sort of universal language piece, in your experience, what country has the best fans? And maybe for you, Jake, that, that should be, you know, what city has the best fans? I'm not sure how much international play you had. But, uh, Jake, or Rashad, let's, let's start with you with this question. Um if I could have done anything different in my career, it probably would have been, uh, I, I probably would have competed a little bit more. I felt like I, I felt like I probably would have competed a little bit more. Cause I felt like at some point I got so caught up with the whole politics of the game that it, it made me kind of get a bitter taste towards just the sport in general rather than just kind of competing because I, I truly enjoyed to compete. I, I enjoyed the journey of what it felt like to just mentally put my mind to something and then eight to ten, uh, 10 to eight weeks later, just knock it out. And, you know, maybe I passed the test, maybe I didn't, but it was always the journey along the way that I enjoyed. And, you know, now I'm on the other side. I kind of missed, I kind of missed that, that feeling, you know, it, it's a, it's a feeling that it's, it's impossible to duplicate anything else, but I just wish I probably would have competed more. And in your experience, was there a country that had the best fans? The best fans that I, I, I've been in, uh, prob probably in Brazil, man. Brazil, Brazil has probably the best fans. The Brazilian fans, uh, they they can get they can get kind of crazy, they can get rowdy, but they ride for their fighters. They're down for their people, and. Uh, you know, if <laughs> I've seen, I mean, it can get kind of crazy. Like they, they'll pelt stuff at you too. You know, so it's a, uh, it's a very, uh, very 
energy enriched environment. So I'll probably say that was probably the best one I, I've been to. Did you ever beat a Brazilian in Brazil? No, never, never in Brazil. No. Just curious. But, to know. I, yeah. But, but I, I, I seen like, <laughs> like just, you know, a lot of stuff getting thrown at fighters who have beaten, you know, Brazilian fighters. What about you, Jake? What would you have done differently in your, your playing days? Yeah, that's a tough question. You know, there was, uh, there's very little regret for me or anything that I look back on that I would have changed too much. I think we've spoken a little bit about our diets and, you know, with habits after games, as far as drinking, I kind of probably would have changed that as far as what I would have been doing with my body post game and, and even pre game. Um, but as I look back on, you know, the 10 years in the league, uh, you know, I, I was real intense all the time. I mean, I had a lot of fun. There were times when I would have fun, mostly in practice. Uh, but, but during the games, during those, those Sundays, you know, I went into a different mode. It was all business. And a lot of times, you know, throwing a touchdown, I would celebrate for a second, but it would be right back to like back into the intensity of it. And there's times where I look back on my career and think, man, I wish I would have just enjoyed the process a little bit more, you know, enjoyed the, the flow of a game and, and, and kind of relished in those moments rather than as Rashad so definitely said, you know, get caught up in the politics and the analyzation, the overanalyzation and the, the questions you're going to have to face even after a victory that, you know, the focus of not on all the good we did, but on, well, what if you, why, why, why did you do this, you know, and the focus on maybe one bad aspect, um, you know, it, it didn't allow me to really tap into those moments to be in it and smiling, you know, on the field. I remember watching Brett Favre a lot and like, damn, this dude is having so much fun out there. Like you can see him laughing and enjoying every moment. I did and I enjoyed those moments, but I was real intense and like screaming at my teammates and kind of a dick on the field as far as like, yo, let's go, you know, having to keep these guys going. So that would have been one thing that I might have changed. Uh, one other thing would be to have taken some time to heal. A few of my seasons, uh, I had some serious injuries that I was playing, you know, 95, 90, maybe 85% to my abilities because of a injured thumb or ribs or back. And there's times I wish I would have just taken maybe a week or two off to heal up and come back. But we're not really given that opportunity because there's someone right behind us that wants our job. So hard to take chosen days off, but I was actually injured a few times where I kind of looked back and wish I'd have taken some time to heal so that I would have played better coming out of that rather than just playing how good I could play for such a long period of time. And then uh, fan wise, you know, I don't know. There's, there's a lot of great cities to play ball in. I love playing in Oakland. And I feel bad that their team got torn away from them to go to Vegas. But the fans there were rabid and mean and crazy and nasty and uh, just fun because you're really going into as we want to make this football game all about war and fighting and battling. You know, that really was <laughs> you know, stuff was getting thrown at our bus. Uh, I handed a ball to a young kid one time after the game and got a beer poured on me. And I'm like, I went to go after the dude and Rod Smith grabbed me. and was like, what are you doing, man? You're getting, you might get knifed up there in the crowd. I mean, that's how serious the Raiders fans were, man. The black hole was the black hole. It was nasty. Uh, but fan wise, like true, like fans that really appreciated you and the game. I loved playing back East in Philly and in New York, they would get on your ass and say nasty stuff. But afterwards, like if you put it down and you and you played and you gave it your all, they were also respectful of, of, of someone that was entertaining for them, that, that entertained them and showed them something, showed them heart, showed them that blue collar, like bad, tough, tough work ethic. Those fans back there really appreciated that. And that's really how I played the game. So I resonated with those fans and thought they were always really in it. Um, you know, of course, the best fans I played in front of were Denver. I mean, that crowd was always packed, sold out stadium. They cheered when we were winning. They cheered when we clinched the playoffs. They were just in it. And those fans really uh, are still to this day, you know, being able to be a Bronco and have those fans adore me and root for me and also be hard on me. I still not, like now really relish in that as far as having 
a reputation there in Denver and a lot of fans that reach out and just say, you know, they loved watching me play and, and, and appreciated what I did. So it's all gratify, gratification from here on out for, for my little bit of ego that's left over. <laughs> that's awesome, man. It, that's just like humans are cool. You know, at the end of the day, universally, humans are, are pretty cool. And for them to be fans of athleticism and sports, then language could kind of dissipate a little bit. So uh, beautiful careers that granted a lot of opportunity to see that and just thinking about them cheering here and there, being rabid fans in uh, Oakland. Like, that's so fun, man. Humans are cool. Uh, you guys are cool. I love you all. And this wraps up this episode on language, I guess. So peace out to each of you. Peace. Love and mushrooms. <laughs>